Welcome to Radio On and to this auspicious full moon October evening with storms brewing in the Berlin background. In the studio we have Mr Brave Ear himself, Jason Oney, with special guest Nicholas Schreck. Jason. Okay. Hey everybody, it's Jason Honey, a.k.a. Boy True, a.k.a. The Shitty Listener, and this is Brave Ear Radio. Radio, radio, radio. Radio. Uh, as we just heard, my guest tonight is Nicholas Schreck. Maybe for a lot of people out there, he doesn't require any introduction whatsoever. But for anybody new to that scene, I'll tell you this. Singer-songwriter, author, and filmmaker Nicholas Schreck's initiatory application of music, ritual, and theater formally began in 1984 when he returned to the West from a life-changing spiritual pilgrimage in Egypt to found the shape-shifting musical ensemble Radio Werewolf, a nine-year sonic magic operation which concluded in 1993. After pioneering early Los Angeles goth and death rock with the band's first incarnation, Radio Werewolf's European phase was halted or, I'm sorry, excuse me, was hailed by Christopher Walton of the band Endura for simultaneously preempting and giving birth to the dark, ambient, and ritual, ritual industrial scene of the 1990s. Before embarking on his current solo career, Sheck has previously collaborated musically with Xena, John Murphy, Death in June, Non, Kingdom of Heaven, and Sir Christopher Lee, whose first album he produced. Shrek's books include... The Manson File, Myth and Reality of an Outlaw Shaman, Demons of the Flesh, The Complete Guide to Left Hand Path, Sex Magic, written with Xena Shrek, The Satanic Screen, and Flowers from Hell. Nicholas will discuss his upcoming October 14th event at The Hole in Berlin, where he will give a talk on his practice of musical magic during his career, screen his 1989 documentary film, Charles Manson Superstar, and celebrate the release of his new collector's item vinyl EP, the Futura model, released on the Epicurean label. Nicholas, thanks for being on Brave Ear. Pleasure to be here, Jason. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, boy. Okay, so tell us about what's going to happen here on uh, October 14th, the event at The Hole. Well, it's it's called The Happening at The Hole, and it's it's a very atmospheric location here in Kreuzberg, actually. And that will be on October 14th, Saturday night. And as you said, I will be giving a discussion, a, a sort of interactive talk with the audience there about my practice of magic and music and the spirituality of sound and how sound can be used for spiritual, metaphysical, and magical purposes. And as a demonstration of that, I will be showing my 1989 film, Charles Manson Superstar, which was an exercise in using music and magic and sound um, to change consciousness. So that will be sort of theory will be I will discuss sonic magic and then the film will demonstrate it. And then after that, there will be the official signing of my new record, the Futura model, which is coming out on Epicurean label. Okay, cool. Um, your talk on music magic is by no means anything new, right? You just did something about a year ago in Leipzig. Uh, actually, not a year, but in June of this year at uh, Wave Gothic Treffen after my concert there, and I gave a pretty extensive introduction to the whole theme of sonic magic. And this is going to be somewhat of a continuation of it. So it may be that some people who are in Leipzig will be here in Berlin, and this will be part two of that. And I'll probably be doing a third and fourth in some other part of Europe okay. as well. But the, the, the first part was basically the theory of it, and I'm going to talk on October 14th more pointedly about how I have specifically applied it in my various musical work over the years. How would you define sonic magic? Well, I've been trying to do that for, uh, <laughs> for a long time. Uh -huh. um, I think the most important thing, the, maybe the, f the first way people can grasp it is if you think about the various senses, our five senses, sound is the most metaphysical because it doesn't quite exist in this realm. It's between the metaphysical world and the physical world. 
and our entire universe and our entire life and our entire consciousness and being are based on vibration, on sound. So by thoughtfully and precisely manipulating sound, you can change consciousness and you can change the material plane of existence. That's on the deepest level, but can you, can you understand what I mean? The, the other senses are more connected to the physical. You see something, it's actually something that's there. You hear something, where is that sound? Right. What's it's, making it? What's making it? A fi- you know, that's a physical, my hand is touching a table right. and making a sound, but where is the sound? So it's halfway between this world and the other worlds. And therefore, it's one of the most effective mediums for changing reality, which is what magic actually is. Is this something that you arrived at, or is this something that was always sort of in your ethers as a young person developing your ideas about music? I would say the answer for that is both. Um, It's not something I arrived at because it's as um, endemic to human nature as going back to the very first songs that were sung were prayers or magical acts. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the earliest humanity, the first songs and sounds that were made were probably prayers or attempts to change reality through the magical use of music. Mm -hmm. And I discovered my own methods of using it, and that's what I'll be talking about during the lecture. But it's, it's, you know, it's part of human tradition. Using sa- I mean, look at all the religions of the world. The core of them, the lineage of them, is based on their music and their sound. Now, in the 21st century, where humanity has lost so much connection to spirituality, and we've gotten to the point where most human beings are not perhaps even aware that there is a spiritual world, because they're so rational and so much part of the cult of logic and science. Absolutely that they don't even realize that there are unseen, invisible forces that affect us and that there are levels of consciousness high above the human level. So sound is one of many ways of contacting that level and changing what goes on here on this level. And it's been my main tool in my art. Did you have a seminal experience as a young person that that made you particularly sensitive to sound? No, I actually, from the very beginning of my life, the, the, according to my mother, the very first word that I spoke was not mother, but record player, because I was so fascinated, particularly <laughs> with the record player and the, the mechanism of putting the needle on the vinyl and how sound was created from it. And when I was very young, I experimented with how changing the radio tuner, I mean practically an infant, would change my mood and how that how and then I observed how what music was played changed people's behavior and their thought pattern. But the the significant landmark in my life that really changed my understanding of it and then sort of gave me the mission of using sonic magic in my work happened in Egypt in 1983. I just wanted to ask about Egypt. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Egypt. I'm going to be talking about this in a little more detail during the talk on October 14th, but basically the element that was important, I went to the tomb of Seti I, who was a pharaoh of Egypt in a Setian dynasty that was connected to the god Set. It was Valley of the Kings? or In the Valley of the Kings. And when I went down there, I heard a particular sound and had a mystical experience with that sound. And, and I, I will go into much more detail on this because sure. it's, it's complicated sure. when I give my lecture. But basically, the sound showed me what the nature of music is and showed me that that is the tool that I should use for my own enlightenment and for the alteration of consciousness in general. Mm -hmm. And it it was a very inspiring moment, but like all mystical experiences, very difficult to communicate in linear language. But it it was, I heard this, what has been called the celestial sound, the sound of reality itself. I had a brief glimpse 
so to speak, of that sound. And that is what set me on my path, that moment. And when I came up from that tomb, back into the bright Egyptian sun, I was a different person. And in some ways... Were you alone? No, I was with someone else, but not when I had the experience. That, that I was alone. Mm -hmm. But um, I haven't been the same person since then, and to a certain degree, I've never really left that moment. It was such an incredibly forceful moment that it changed me completely. I so, understand that completely. So, were your parents musicians? Uh, my father was an amateur musician, but he, among the many things he did, like your father, he was a naval mm -hmm. officer, right? And um, he managed jazz bands, and he and he and some pop bands as well. I mean, he was basically a nomadic person that took whatever work he could get. He was a freelance writer, got it, naval reserve, mm -hmm. and but he managed a lot of bands. So when I was very young, my the first record I ever got was Count Basie, who he was working with wow. in Las Vegas at the Sands <clears throat> right before a Frank Sinatra concert. Uh, Basie gave me a concert called Basie Plays Bond, and it was the of the James Bond themes. Uh, the first time I played a piano was sitting in Count Basie's lap when I was a child in Las Vegas, and he, you know, he put my hands on the piano. Golly. Yep. Wow. So, yeah, and the first time I held a microphone, uh, my father was, was promoting a show that Herman's Hermits was doing. And wow. Pe Peter Noon mm -hmm. from Herman's Hermit mm -hmm. had me come up on the stage and showed me how to use the microphone. So, yeah, I grew up with show business people around me all the time. Yeah, because you mentioned one time as well, too, uh, your dad told me, or you, you told me your dad told you that you were staying home from school because it was something way more interesting to do. Right. And you ended up going to a room, and there sat Vincent Price. Right. Um, yeah, that, that was the kind of person my father was. He, mm -hmm. he, he, um, he said, well, we're going to do something really... I was, of course, a huge Vincent Price fan as a child and remain so to this day. This was in probably 1969 or so, at the height of Monster Mania, when horror films were having their silver age, you could say. Yeah. So every weekend there were incredible horror films playing. So you know, it wasn't it wasn't a vintage thing at that point. It was an ongoing phenomenon. And my father said, "You're not going to go to school today. We're going to just do something really boring. You're going to come with me to this uh Sears Roebuck event." And I thought, "That's going to be Why are we doing this stupid thing?" So he takes me there and then opens the door as you said, mm -hmm. and there's Vincent Price sitting there and he had arranged it so that he could meet me. And I was, of course, thrilled because he was, you know, one of my childhood idols. Twice Told Tales, mm -hmm. or Tales Told Twice. Fall, Twice Told Tales. Fall from the House of Usher, yeah. and all of those, Dr. Fibes, etc. Man. So, and then, and then uh, I met him quite a few times after that. Mm -hmm. God, all my dad did was hang out with Japanese fighter aces. <laughs> well, my father had some encounters with the Japanese too, but they weren't quite as friendly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But um, I can only imagine. Um, okay, so we've also we've got the talk, which I'm really hoping I can get to catch, and then we also have Charles Manson Superstar. Right, right. Well, I think I think the first thing we should do is, uh, as far as the talk on music and magic, maybe we should begin because you you know like Frank Zappa said, talking about. Music is like dancing about architecture. Right. So what I would like to do first is play a particular Radio Werewolf track okay. from 1989. And Good. this is one of the first collaborations that Zena and I did after we worked together at the 8888 rally. When we, that was our first coming together. That was at the Strand, right? Yep, in San Francisco. This was the first recording we did together. And this is from the Radio Werewolf EP, Lightning in the Sun, and it's called Against Time. Love and that I, name. And I think it will illustrate better than any words I could say what I'm talking about with sonic magic, because it is, in fact, perhaps one of the purest exercises of sonic magic that we did. That particular EP, I think, captures the essence of Radio Werewolf maybe more precisely than anything else we ever did. So this is... 
Against Time from Radio Werewolf's Lightning and the Sun from 1989. You're listening to Radio On, and this is Bravia Radio with Jason Oni and special guest Nicholas Schreck. I liked all those pops and chirps there at the end. Um, you wanted to mention something about that track. Right. Um, that particular album or EP, Lightning in the Sun by Radio Werewolf, the thing about it, why it is particularly illustrative of the topic of sonic magic that I'm talking about. And maybe this is something your listeners will be able to get if they're unfamiliar with the topic. Is one of the themes of the lightning and the sun is how music and art can change history, actually. How hearing a particular song, seeing a particular painting, seeing a particular creation or experiencing the work of an artist can actually change the tide of history. And that is a lot of what The Lightning in the Sun, that particular release, is about. So what I wanted to say about that is, maybe this is a way to answer your first question a little more clearly. When you write a song, and you're a songwriter and a singer, so you know 
what I mean. When you write a song, you're creating a self-contained universe that is a mirror of the world and reality that we live in. But when you create this artificial secondary universe of a song or a musical composition, it becomes a microcosm of the larger world. And whatever you're doing in that microcosm of the song changes your listener. And you can see that when you perform. You know, you've, you've written something and then you perform it again. It changes the consciousness of the, rea the outer reality. And that's true with a novel, a film. Any artistic creation is an act of magic because it imitates the world. It creates a artificial reflection of the world and then reflects itself back to the person who experiences it. So even an artist who isn't consciously thinking of magic or sorcery is performing a kind of magic. And it changes... An act the, of magic. An act of magic and changing the world that we live in. For instance, the horrible, you know, superficial level of popular culture right now makes people stupider. It's, it's not that the people are setting out to do it, but it's, it's creating a stupider, more dense spiritual world that we live in because of the very low level of what popular culture, film and music, what it's turned into. So it's also possible to transcend that and to wake people up through music. Mm -hmm. And that has been the main thing that I've been trying to do through many different methods many different strategies. How do you wake people up when they're sleepwalking is what my entire work, whatever it is, that's what it's basically all about. Mm -hmm. Because you have to understand, human beings are literally sleepwalking. I get what you mean. Um, where'd the name Radio Werewolf come from? Well, I didn't think of it. Um, some propagandists in the Third Reich did, as is well known and has been much misunderstood. But Radio Werewolf was the last broadcasting station for the werewolf movement, which was a terrorist resistance movement against the Soviets and allies as they were, had, were starting. Spring to, of 45. Exactly. And it was basically a very low budget, small level thing. It was basically an attempt to make the Allies and Soviets believe that there was a functional terrorist organization that was going to resist them. Nothing much came of it, really, as you probably know, because I know you're well-versed in World War II history as well. But my, I just thought it was the perfect name for what I was doing, because it's the, it's the actual meaning of the name that was important to me, not its political context. Radio Werewolf means transmitting, putting out a broadcast into people's mind and transforming them. And my animal totem is the werewolf on a metaphysical level. So, I mean, also the early radio werewolf, too, it, pe people have made much more of its political significance than I intended. Also, it's, it was part of the whole horrific image that we had at that time. So... But, but, you know, it, I was always fascinated with the radio in general, as I said, even since a child. The very idea that invisible waves going through the air in, in the analog era... Got it. Yeah. ...change your consciousness. And so that's what I meant by Radio Werewolf. Okay. And, it, and I have to say, too, is a lot of people still think it's continuing because young people discover it constantly. And in the Internet age, what, what you discover yesterday, you think it's still happening. But Radio Werewolf was a particular magical operation, like a mission. It had a goal. We began it, and we concluded it when some of those goals were finished and when we went on to another form. But when, you're, when you've completed a ritual, you don't just keep doing it. So it wasn't like a band that you keep milking it dry forever. So people ask me to do a reunion of it or a new version of it and that's impossible because it was a magical operation that had an intention. When its intention was finished, mm -hmm. the operation finished. And given what you've just told us about music magic and what you've also just told us too about what it is that happens when um, you write a song, um, do you have your own definition for music? 
I don't, I don't think music can even be defined, actually. It's, for me, it's a spiritual force. It's a, it's a spiritual force, and it's, it's a means of consciousness transformation for the musician and for the listener. It's a pure way of communicating with people that goes beyond the linear. Mm -hmm. And you could use any art form, but my particular tool is sound. <coughs> But I don't, I don't think, music is not what people think it is. It changes your body, it changes your inner winds, it changes what is known in the Eastern tradition as the chakras. It, it, you know, it functions on a much higher level than people can even imagine, and that's part of what I'll try to explain. It's an extremely high level of communication, that's for sure. Yeah. Much, much higher than linear verbal communication. Even though you use lyrics in a song sometimes, the... The melody alone communicates something that cannot be put into words. Are you directing your music at anyone in particular? No, it, it has a universal application, and I've never tried to define it very much. People are always asking me to explain what I meant by this or that or interpret it. And really, like quantum physics, everybody hears music differently, what they experience from it is very different. So I have an intention, but once I've released it into the world, it takes on its own life. In many ways, it's been, as I've said before, like a Frankenstein's monster. It's created intentions I did not want, mm -hmm. particularly when I was younger and experimenting with it and trying to figure out what the mechanics of sonic magic were. I think it, it was like a genie that you let out of its bottle and created some very dangerous and negative effects, uh, I had to step back from it for a while to sort of fine-tune the technology. I mean, you're creative on so many different levels, yeah? Um, what is there, or what is it in music um, that allows you to create what you need that you probably don't get from writing or doing film or anything like that? I think because, as I said, it, it is the, it's the most removed from the earthly realm. A sound is so subjective, it's, it's beyond the linear and the rational. And it has the deepest emotional effect immediately. It's the one I respond to the most, that's for sure. And I, and I do think it's a personal thing for some. People are completely dead to music. It doesn't mean anything to them. You know, but it, you know, it's a subjective personal issue. I think music moves me the most of the arts, and therefore it's the one that I'm most attracted to communicating in. Got it. And I do feel like when I'm singing a song, I'm saying something much more pure and clear than anything I could say in any rational form. How important are lyrics for you? Well, lyrics are not poetry to me lyrics have to be sung to really make sense that to me lyrics are part of the song as much as the rhythm you know that using the exactly right word is part of the melody so to me lyrics are are intrinsic to the music not a separate art form got it um and i and i use a lot of double meanings in my lyrics and different layers to them although i don't do it consciously i try to open myself to what is the best way to express what that particular song needs. And I've said this before, I'm not really interested in what most people are doing is confessing or self-expression or writing a diary entry where this is what I feel. I'm, I'm usually guided by the needs of the song itself. I feel like the song has something to say and I try to be the vehicle for what it's saying. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. For me, I, I always thought the lyrics were the song within the song. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about Charles Manson Superstar a right. little bit? Because sure. you're going to be um, you're going to be showing this or talking about it at least. I know I'm going to I'm going well, to I'm going to be showing Charles Manson Superstar. This is the first time it's been screened by me personally in Berlin since October of 1989. Right. Shortly before the wall fell. Mm -hmm. I came to Berlin for the Berlin premiere of it shortly after the Los Angeles and Canadian and New York premiere, which was on the 20th anniversary of the Tate LaBianca murders. Wow. And uh, we played it at the Kino Eisite 20, yeah, 
20 years after the murder. So it was October of 89. And this will be the first time I will show the film and speak about it since then. And last time it knocked the wall down. So we'll see what happens this time. I can't even do the math. How long ago were those murders now? 1969. I'm not much of a mathematician, so I'll leave that to you. But... <laughs> uh, that's why I asked you. Right. Yeah. Near, nearly 50 years, obviously. Yeah, nearly 50 years. Which is hard to believe. Their, the fascination about them and the legend and the myth about them just keeps growing and becoming more ridiculous and overblown. But that's why it's a myth. It is, it's actually become a legend. Did you... Was there a bit of music that you wanted to play? Yeah. Well, um, it, let me. Yeah, I'll, let me introduce that. Yeah. What I want, I want to try to stick to the musical theme here because it's easy to digress in thousands, means. thousands of other strands. In 1985, I contacted Manson, uh, and we had a rapport. And the first thing we wanted to do was he was very adamant about wanting to put some of his music out because at that time you could only get, you know, cruddy sounding cassette tapes of his music, really bad quality. And in fact, at that time, hardly anyone was truly aware of what his music sounded like, which is hard to believe now It's because it's all over the internet. But in 1985, very few people had even heard it. And there was the general idea from Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi and the mainstream narrative about Manson that he was a talentless, want to be, you know, just a, Quack. De a, de a desperate, talentless nobody who wanted to be in the music industry. So he was always very dissatisfied that nobody really heard his music. So there was a particular tape we wanted to put out of his. And that's a whole other story. But the original plan was to go to San Quentin Prison with a recording crew and record a concert of Manson playing his music and record it properly, show him, you know, so people have an idea of what he was as a performer and singer-songwriter. At the last minute, the San Quentin bureaucrats decided, after much paperwork and, and tangling with them and arguing with them and back and forth, they said he can't have a guitar when you come here because he could use it as a weapon. Um, so at the last minute, we had to change what would have been a musical performance to an interview. And that's what became the core of my film, Charles Manson Superstar, was this pretty spontaneous conversation between me and him after we had had several years of correspondence. Um, however... The film, because it was very widely seen all over the world, introduced people to his music in a much, probably a better, more powerful way than had we just released a record. So one of the songs that he gave me permission to use, I used it as the theme song of the film, is called I'm on Fire, and this is the theme song to Charles Manson Superstar, and it's one of my personal favorites of his uh, 80s work. He recorded this, I think, in Vacaville Prison shortly before moving to San Quentin. But this is the theme of Charles Manson Superstar. Okay, and this is what we're going to hear right now. I'm on fire. I'm on by, fire. By Charles Manson. Here we go. <laughs>
growing as my going begins to know. My knowing begins to surrender, and my surrenderance as I go. And my thinking in my mind now, and I'm thinking from within. Thinking now and forever, and I'm beyond crime or sin. Push up on the mountain, and my mind, you know, on the top. Yeah, I'll get it on on the high bars in the Hebrew Doctor Rover. Uh huh. Many of my mouths get it bound round to get the record home. She don't fist bump, baby. Well, driving's all on home. She get on the phone or wrist bump. Can't come, come to bump your head. Don't blow up in your stomach and blow off your motherfucking head. Don't you want to bounce on a rifter? Don't you want to don't you dream? Don't you want to walk on talking? Don't you want to walk on me? Don't you want to make on whisper with the hobo mind of tea? That don't you want on the walking? Got a bone yesterday. Got a pot and got it cooking. Got my widgets and my bones. Got my beer on my surrender as my movement on my own. Got my whisper in my whisper cat. Got my cats up in the tree. Got the whiskers on the willow. Got the willows on the tree. Got the trees on the spaceman. Got the spaceman on the dirt. Got the moving on the monkey. Got the monkey wearing shirts. Got the wings out on string and got my string from my head. Got my whiskers in my yellow and my yellows in my Okay, everybody, this is Jason Honey, a.k.a. The Shady Listener, a.k.a. Boy True, and this is Brave Ear Radio. I'm here tonight with Nicholas Schreck, uh, who, as if you've been following us over the last 45 minutes or so, is hosting an event um, October 14th at The Hole in Kreuzberg here in Berlin. The exact address, The Hole, is Schlesische Straße 37. Schlesische Straße 37. Schlesische Straße 37. Yeah? If you can make it down, I think it'd be more than an interesting evening. There's an awful lot to see. There's an awful lot to talk about. Awful lot to hear. Um, we've just been talking a bit about Manson. We've been talking a bit about uh, Charles Manson Superstar, the film. We just heard a song by Manson, I'm on Fire. Um... I had a couple of questions while we were talking mm -hmm. and listening to that. Fire um, away. It sounded like there was an entire band back there, or at least when it started, it sounded like there was somebody back there stroking well, on a cello. Well, he's recording it in his cell, so you're hearing people behind him screaming. And... Mm hmm Yeah. That was from 1985. 1985, 1986, something like that. I'm not quite sure. But... Uh -huh. but one thing I thought we should talk about, because you may be the only person qualified to actually understand it, um, in one of our first conversations, we talked about the germs. Yes, we did. And, and I think uh, maybe for the benefit of our Teutonic listeners who may not be familiar with Californian culture, maybe you should set it up and explain what the germs were. Okay, well, I mean, in talking about music magic, um, anybody who knows me knows that one of my big hobbies uh, is the germs. Um, this is a band I've been fascinated with for years and years and years. Um, the Germs were probably one of the first bands to ever start playing a truly accelerated kind of punk rock. A band that, for better or for worse, seemed to sort of take on its own monolithic uh, legend in its own time type mythic stature uh, that seemed to leave uh, a trail and a sense of magic. Some people might be arfing from the side right now by my saying that, yeah. But for myself and for lots of other people I know, uh, we're very, very touched by this band. Um, it's not a pretty music by any means. Um, their only long-playing document, GI, is probably a record that from that period of time that I think still sounds like a very ferocious and, dare I say, also harrowing document. There's nothing quaint about that record at all. Yeah. Um, I know for a fact as well, too, that both the singer and the guitar player, Darby and Pat, also, as young people, had a huge fascination um, with Charles Manson and his friends, 
his group out there at Spawn Ranch. And that's where we began talking. And you mentioned as well, too, right. that from day one, you had sort of been around the germs. Now, you went to high school. You went to uni I, high. I was in uni high right after them. At the, at the time, I'm, I met them in the summer of 1977. But the thing that's relevant to this evening is my whole research into Manson and my whole personal involvement in the whole Manson phenomenon First of all, to set this up, 1975, Squeaky Fromm did her action with Gerald, Gerald Ford. Ford. Whether whether she intended to fire a gun or not, I can't really say, but that got my attention. I had certainly been aware of the case when I was younger, in 1970, during the trial. But 1975, um, I became... A, I, I, that was the first time, because of Lynette Fromm, that there was anything in the media about what Manson actually believed. Before that, it's hard to remember this now, all you had was what little bit leaked out from the two very negative books about him, Helter Skelter. Well, the media hyperbole. And the family and the courtroom um, explanation of his beliefs and philosophy, which was mostly contrived to convict him. But what did he actually believe really wasn't mentioned until Lynette Fromm started talking about it after she was arrested for the alleged assassination attempt on President Gerald Ford in 1975. Did she actually fire the gun at him or she no. just pointed it at him? No, she had the gun and uh, the Secret Service took it from her. You know, what her actual motive and purpose, I wouldn't speak for her. But mm. the thing is... That reignited my interest in the case because I found what she was saying was common sense about ecology, being against pollution, saving the animal, saving the forest, things that are actually quite common beliefs now but were considered radical. And she was talking about ecological survival. So I thought, and I, I, was, I was very impressed with her lucidity on these subjects. Then part two, 1976, I met Timothy Leary right after he got out of prison, and he had been in prison right ne in a cell right next to Manson in Folsom Prison. And I was about I was 14 then, and I went to see him appear at the L.A. Book Fair and spoke to him in some detail about it, and he was quite open. And he looked at me in a certain way that had a, <laughs> that had I mean if I could imitated on the radio I would show you but he had a certain smile and a certain look in his eyes and he said there was so much more to that case than anyone will ever know and he laughed in a certain way and he also said that the way Manson is presented by the media has nothing to do with the actual person that he met and there's other odd things that I got into with Leary a few years later an interesting thing about him, before I get into the germs, which is the next year, uh, I didn't know this until recently. Uh, at, shortly after that meeting with him, Leary married one of the two women who were the last people to have lunch with Sharon Tate, an actress named Barbara Lewis. So I'm quite sure that he had a very clear idea because of his knowledge of the drug underworld his being in prison, his connection to these people. I'm I'm quite sure he knew what really happened or at least had a very clear idea of it. But that would go off into a whole other category of thought. So the 75, Squeaky Fromm opened me to it. 76, Timothy Leary intrigued me with what the hell was he talking about, that there's much more to this case than you'll ever know. 1977... Um, you're at uni high. I, no, I was, out, I was not yet in uni high, but I was go, the next year I went there, and that became another link between us. I went there for, and then I went to Venice High, but I was in uni high, I guess, a year after they had graduated. Okay, but you were not in this IPS program. No, no, that was a Scientology-run program. I knew about it and saw all the eccentric things that came out of it, but that was pretty much for fuck-ups and... Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> Not mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, germs, germs, germs. June twenty first, the summer solstice of nineteen seventy seven. My girlfriend, who was thirteen at the time, the only way we could go on a date 
was if her brother escorted her and her father would think that she was safe because her brother was escorting her. But her brother was one of the first high muckamucks in the tiny world of what was just beginning to be called punk in Los Angeles. And you won't mention any names. Not at the moment. Okay. But his his idea of safe <laughs> of safe escort was he would go get high with Joan Jett at that apartment at her house right across from the whiskey mm. with every visiting punk rocker from England, the damned or generation. Whenever any punk rock band came, they would go get high at Joan Jett's house before the concert. So my girlfriend would be left out on the street because her brother wouldn't want her to go in to see what was happening. And the babysitter, so to speak, she was a guy named Bobby Pin, Ooh. who would who would watch her and keep her safe. And she got along with him fine. So June 21st, 1977 was our first date. And on Rodney on the Rock, which was a very influential radio show from... K-Rock. Rod- K Rock from Rodney Bingenheimer, which was the only place that played any kind of what would be called alternative music whatsoever at that point, was hyping this new wave weekend run by Kim Fowley, who had been his associate for 10 years before that. So Kim Fowley presents New Wave Night, and a band called The Screamers that I already had heard through rumor of how fantastic they were supposed to be, their reputation. Preceded, preceded them. them after just one tiny performance there was a buzz about them in that pre-internet world i wonder where they played it was at a party for slash magazine actually. okay all right anyway i was very enthused to see that so we went on summer solstice 77 to the whiskey a go-go and bef- that very day i was basically a hippie the day before that i had hair down to here um, like some kind of glam hippie is what I was at that point, 15 years old. And I cut my hair that day very short, and we both wore leather jackets. And there really wasn't an idea of what punk rock is at that moment, but that was sort of like a transition point, that summer solstice. So we went to the concert waiting to see the Screamers, but the Screamers canceled at the last minute, I believe, because Tomato Du Plenty, who I later got to know, was sick. So the replacement band was basically Rodney Bingenheimer got on the stage, and then a girl named Belinda Carlisle, who later became the singer Belinda of the Carlisle. Gorgos, yeah, came up to introduce a <laughs> band called The Germs, and my girlfriend said, oh yeah, this is that guy Bobby Pin who watches me. And we watched what, in my mind, remains one of the worst, most amateurish, unimpressive, (laughs) just absurdly stupid performances I've ever seen. And I was 15 years old, and I thought this is adolescent and juvenile and moronic. Go into more detail. I will, I will. So that was my impression. At the time, I'll explain this for your German... Listeners, there was a show called The Gong Show, (laughs) which you had amateur performers come on, and they were so terrible that eventually the host would ring a gong to get rid of them. And that's what it seemed like, like a novelty joke band of the lowest order. And I thought, this is punk rock, this is subversive or anarchistic or anything. It was just a dumb adolescent prank, basically. So... He, Bobby Pinn had told his friends to bring food to this concert. So when they, I, if I'm remembering it correctly, they performed Sugar Sugar by the Archies, the pop song, and did a, you know, very inept version of it. Now, the thing I have to say is, at that moment, I was more interested in the old history of the Whiskey A Go Go. Right. And not... I wasn't really that enthused about the whole punk rock thing. I was thinking every generation gets its bohemian subculture, and I thought there were the Dadaists, the Surrealists, the Beatniks, the Hippies, the Psychedelic Underground, etc. And I thought, how did I get stuck with this dumb thing when I was looking at what 
how punk rock was being presented at that moment in June of 77. And uh, so this performance went on and they everybody threw food during a performance of Sugar, Sugar. But I was interested in what had been gone, going on at the Whiskey A Go-Go 10 years earlier during the psychedelic era with the doors and love. The seeds. The seeds, all of that. And so I got... During the concert, even, I got to talking to some of the older people that were there. I didn't even know their names at that moment, but it was Elmer Valentine, who was the founder of the Whiskey A Go Go. The guy he opened it, right? He opened it in 1964, and he should eternally be given credit for inventing the Go Go Dancer, one of the best inventions of the 20th century. So um, he was an old mafia guy, very corrupt cop who moved from Chicago to L.A. and opened the Whiskey and then the Roxy and PJs and the Trip, all of the swinging places in the 60s. So now the music world had died out and punk rock was like, it was like he was trying to bring the Whiskey back to life and he spoke to Kim Fowley and said, can you bring some kind of new music here? So he hired the Germs to fill in for the Screamers that night what I didn't know, but, and then I'll tell you this after we hear the song, to set the stage perfectly. The germs come on and give this dismal amateurish performance where Bobby Pin is hardly singing into the microphone. Only Pat Smear has any competence whatsoever with his guitar. Smear had assless jeans on, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And if I remember, they were wearing Band-Aids or something on their clothes, it just looked ridiculous. It was just, you could never imagine that we would be talking about it 40 years later, let's put it that way. So, okay, now to set the stage, they played Sugar Sugar. And now this is the very concert that I attended June 21st, 1977, one of the Germs' first major performances. And food is being thrown everywhere Bobby Pin, who would later become Darby It's almost like Crash. Rocky Horror. It was, yeah, it was very glitter-like, Rocky <laughs> Horror-like, exactly. That was the feel of it, and these people were from the whole glitter era yeah, exactly. with Rodney Bingenheimer, so that made perfect sense. So they're, they're throwing sugar at the audience. The audience is throwing food all over the whiskey, a go-go. Mustard and flour and... Salad dressing all over the place. Yeah. Every, Okay, so now, not because I like it, but to set the stage, I will punish you by playing the Germs' performance, June 21st, 77, of Sugar Sugar. Punish me, punish me, but I gotta say, I do love Pat's guitar playing on this. No, he was always a great guitar player. Here we go. <laughs> he, 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 was, he was the only competent member at that point. So, Sugar Sugar. <laughs> Sugar, 
So if you were to teleport yourself back in time right. and be there, mm-hmm. um, you probably would have been looking over your shoulder because didn't somebody indicate to you where it was that Charlie used to sit? Sorry, Charles used to well, sit? On it, to tell you the truth, all I was thinking about was my girlfriend at that moment. That was the only reason I was there. Got it. But uh, what happened to meet, I, why I've forced the audience to listen to that song is if you can then imagine he had been throwing sugar and food everywhere and then the mafia guys that ran the whiskey a go-go and were still running it nine years later when i played there with radio werewolf which became even more interesting again because of the manson connection uh elmer valentine was there to see how this punk rock thing would work and here they have these people trashing the whiskey a go-go with food everywhere he sends out this thug that looks like he came from Central Casting Godfather, uh, you sure. know, mm-hmm. like a pit boss type of guy, and he's screaming at everyone to clean up the stuff. And then I, I rec- understood that that was then the owner, this, this mafia-looking guy who was watching and seemed completely inappropriate. And I got to talking to him and a guy named Mario Maglieri, who I think was the manager i'm not quite sure what his role was but he was like the middleman between elmer valentine the owner and founder of the whiskey and who dealt with the bands mario maglieri and he too looked like straight out of a 1940s mafia yeah yeah completely out of place with these punk rock they hit anybody no, but they grabbed people by the scruff of the neck and said clean up this fucking shit you fucking kids and you know, it, mm. so it turned into a pretty violent confrontation, and the germs were banned from playing there for a few months anyway. But they did bring in a crowd, and all those people cared about was money. So eventually, they made up for this first crime. But all right, I got to talking to them about the '60s, and I don't remember exactly how at it the came show you at, did. The, at that very show. And this gave me some crucial insights into the whole Manson thing that really not many people had at that moment because it's very limited information in 1977. And uh, Elmer Valentine told me two things, and he went further with it in other meetings at the Whiskey because we would go there constantly from then on. And we saw almost every punk and new wave band you can imagine, their L.A. debut, Devo, Blondie, all you know, you name it, we saw every one of them. And as he opened up a bit, but that very time he pointed out what used to be called the VIP booth in the Whiskey A Go Go. And he said in 1968, which would have been only nine years before that concert, that Terry Melcher, Dennis Wilson, and Manson were sitting in the VIP booth of the Whiskey. And he described a night that Manson and his girls went out and danced. I can't remember who he said the band was. Maybe Love, mm-hmm. maybe The Doors, but it could have been someone more. I don't remember who the band was. But he went and danced and mesmerized everybody who watched that performance. And he talked about him like he was just a normal guy, like another... Charlie, me- Charles mesmerized everybody. Yeah, with this dance. But Boy, what did that look like? Well, you can imagine from what you've seen, but... The, th- the point was the way Elmer Valentine talked about him with some resentment and obviously some dislike, but just talked about him like another musician who was part of the music world of that time, hanging out with Terry Melcher, who, if people don't know who that was, was one of the most influential producers, producers. of that time, who had created the, the birds bird sound and, you know, was one of the main innovators in, in rock music production at that time. So he's... The way that Elmer Valentine described him, I had a different idea of him than this bloodthirsty, psychotic monster that the media presented him only at that time. Right. And it was clear, I I could see him as just, he's another Hollywood character, like the people right here. And the other interesting thing was, Elmer Valentine, I spoke to him and Mario Maglieri several times later, I slowly pieced together J.C. Sebring and Sharon Tate met each other 
the the reason they came together was because Elmer Valentine introduced them at a party he held at the Whiskey and at his home. Now, they were together for a while. Yeah. In 1964, around the time the Beatles came, Sharon Tate lived on Clark Street, right near the Whiskey A Go Go, and she had met uh, Jay Sebring through Elmer Valentine. So this guy, this old mafia corrupt cop who ran the whiskey introduced them which basically created the causes and conditions that eventually led to the catastrophe in 1969 that's yellow yeah and not only did he introduce sebring and sharon tate at this whiskey go-go party but on the night of sharon tate's murder august 8th 9th 1969 he and steve mcqueen were going to go to the oh, house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, later, I figured out why Steve McQueen was going there to buy drugs from Jay Sebring, who he and Sharon Tate had a menage a trois with for years, and Sebring was McQueen's main drug dealer. He was going up there that night to buy drugs. Elmer Valentine and him were going out to pick up girls instead, so they didn't go that night. They found out about it right away, the murder, and Steve McQueen went to Jay Sebring's house and arranged through other people he knew to clean out all of Sebring, all of Sebring's stash Steph. before before the cops came and figured out what was happening. So it became clear to me Elmer Valentine, not the founder of the whiskey, not only brought Sebring and Tate together, but like as a bookend of that almost went there that night and many hollywood people yeah, you say i almost, almost went was, there that if, night. if everyone who said they were going to be there there'd be no room to use a knife you know but they really were and uh mario Maglieri, Maglieri had a much more negative idea of manson he remembered a lot of confrontations with him and him being arrogant and pushy but he was too and i think they both sensed two guys from the underworld in this hippie environment. I think they recognized each other on the same criminal wavelength. So that, but what it showed me was, okay, if Elmer Valentine knows Sharon Tate and Elmer Valentine knows Manson, this world, they're not very different from each other, you know? And that was not something that was generally understood in the 70s. You know, the, the basic idea of the myth is these, you know, desperate renegade hippies out in outer space somewhere invaded and attacked the houses of perfect strangers. But that was my first intimation. Okay, they're hanging around the same Sunset Strip rock music world. They have at least one acquaintance in common. And then as I looked much deeper into the case, I saw that, of course, they knew each other. And But that gets into much deeper areas that I cover in my book, The Manson File. I think one of but the key- so that, that I just want to point out, so that in that very day, June twenty first, seventy seven, I got the first intimations of that through these casual conversations. Now, the interesting thing is then I got to talking to Bobby Pinn, as he was called then, later Darby, and Pat Smear, and we immediately had a rapport because they were the first two people I met who were as interested in the whole Manson case as I was. I mean, they had read everything that was available, which wasn't much, and I had too. And so we talked a great deal about the case and talked to these older guys about their encounters with Manson right there. That very day was the first day I met Rodney Bingenheimer. He told me that he had seen... He had met Manson at a Beach Boys recording session of, I believe, the song Cabin Essence. So that that also, you don't you didn't get that impression that he's hanging around a Beach Boys recording session, that he's in the VIP booth. So suddenly I had a very different picture than what the media presented of all this. And and it was in that and then talking to Darby and Pat Smear, Darby was more obsessed with it than Pat Smear, but both of them knew a lot about it, much more than most people. So that was that was kind of coalesced that the whole Manson research and gave me a clear perspective of him as a human being, as a musician who was part of that world, not as some kind of demon. So that 
that was a very significant point in uh, in my work on that. Have you ever mentioned this stuff to Charles Manson? Oh yeah, and not not only have I mentioned it, but when I'm sure you have, but yeah, it, it, I'm I mean, curious as to what he'd had what he would have had to say about Elmer Valentine. And, oh, he he detested both Mario Malieri and Elmer Valentine. And the interesting thing is, nine years later, in 1987, when Radio Werewolf was playing the Whiskey a Go Go, he. I mean, I was very young then. He was almost being like a mentor and saying, you can't trust these people, man. They're all the mob. They're just, you know, he, he told me they're running concessions to deal drugs. And that basically what he said was the entire Sunset Strip and the whole music industry, which he knew very well, was basically run by the underworld. And that, it, you know, that, uh, for instance, he talked in detail about payola, and how cocaine and drug dealers are who assured what became a hit song, and uh, and you know he he acted like be careful with these people, and uh, and I played at the Roxy in 1985, um, and I don't remember which of them it was, whether it was Valentine or Maglieri. They were also involved with the Roxy, which is right down the street on Sunset Strip with Radio Werewolf. And we performed a song called Sister Lucretia in which I was crucified and had blood on me and was like Christ on the cross. And these, one of these mafia guys was so offended by that that, you know, he complained that we were being sacrilegious. So, you know, <laughs> historical cycles continue and turn around. Right. Yeah, but he, he Manson had a very negative idea of those people. So that that really placed it in real life for me, if you can understand what I mean, and showed me connections that had not been discussed in in the media at that time. Okay, um, I've never actually seen uh, Charles Manson Superstar. Mm -hmm. uh, did you not say earlier that actually Charles Manson Superstar is a collection of interviews you did with it's, him? It's 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 basically it's it's a narrative structure put around this long interview that I did with him in San Quentin. Now, the, w the way that I produced Charles Manson Superstar, when I did the interview, it was very hard to get an exclusive interview with Manson, and this was at the height of what was called the Satanic Panic in America, when peop the media was hysterical about occult influences during the Reagan era, and born-again Christianity was very, you know, had infected and seeped into the media. So a very hysterical, paranoid atmosphere. And it was hard to get an exclusive interview with Manson. So the TV show Current Affair right. that was owned by the Fox Corporation, Maury, Maury Povich, right. interviewed me about my first edition of the book, The Manson File. And they bought just a few minutes of clips of my interview with Manson. And they paid so much for it, I was able to finance the making of the film so they, the first time any of my interview with them was shown was on Current Affair, and Maury Povich did this very hostile interview, and a guy named Steve Dunleavy interviewed me. Um, so they, in other words, the enemy financed my film. The media that was creating this nonsensical myth are who actually helped to finance the film. And then the next year, on the 20th... Did you ever let them know that? No, but on the 20th anniversary of the murders in 1989, when I showed the very night we showed Charles Manson Superstar in Los Angeles, um, Current Affair stupidly showed many, many more minutes of the film that they bought for me, but unauthorized, and they oh. didn't pay me. So we sued them, and we won, and that actually financed how Zena and I left America and went to Austria. So, in a strange way, that film has been a kind of, and I've said this before, a kind of guardian angel in my life. It's very often um, created benevolent effects. In my has existence. Charles Manson himself ever been able to see it? No, he's been able he, to hear. To, he, 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 can't. he can't see. Uh -uh. No. no. Hmm. I've, you know, I've, I think he gets a lot of reaction about it, and he knows that it was positive, but I don't, you know, he's signed things to me pictures from it that people have sent him so he's very aware of it but unfortunately i guess this is my question is how aware is he of of it or was he of it oh at he the time? was very aware of it yeah 
Yeah. He did, I mean, now the thing with Manson is uh, basically my relationship with him was very pragmatic. First I put out this book, The Manson File, because he didn't like this book called Manson in His Own Words that a writer named Newell Emmons had done. And he asked me, could, he put to, could we put together a compilation of his real words? Because he felt that misrepresented him. So we did that. Then we were going to do this concert film that turned into the interview that became Charles Manson Superstar. One of the things that's absolutely fascinated me, one of the things you told me when we first met, uh, is that Manson had actually drawn you guys a map. Mm -hmm. And with this map in hand, you guys were able to go out and recovered uh, well, we, buried we, gas we, cans, buried we, ammo caches. Yeah, every, uh, <laughs> co coffee cans. He knew exactly. He gave us a map, which we thought, we're, we're not going to find anything, in Death Valley. And me and a friend went out there, and we followed his map as best we could and actually found under this rock, here was a coffee can that they had kept for emergency rations. Here was a gas can. Here was, you know, all barbed wire. Ammo. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. And he was able to remember that. That was stuff that he had put out there in 1969, and this was 1987, and he remembered exactly where it was. Okay, so you'll be showing the film mm -hmm. in its entirety right. uh, on the 14th. Yep. Yeah. By the way, again, I, I don't mean to be obnoxious, but I just want to plug it again. Nicholas Schreck will be hosting an event October 14th at The Hole in Kreuzberg here in Berlin. Schlesische Strasse 37. Um, he'll be giving a lecture on music magic. He will be showing Charles Manson Superstar. And he will also be playing for us. Or are you going to play? Yeah, we're going to. We're, I, don't know if we'll, I don't know if we'll play it, but I will be the, the first copies of the EP, the Futura model, which is coming out officially on October 23rd. Whoever comes there, I will sign a copy of it for them. So that will be the official release for that record. Fantastic. Now this is uh this is a Nicholas Shrek solo effort. Right. It's um we we performed this song the first time at the Wave Gothic Treffen in June. And this is on keyboards Winfried Strauss. Yeah, I wanted to say who else is in the band. Yeah, Winfried, or ask. Winfried Strauss on keyboards. Uh Ona Sorg that's her talents on the bass, and Heathen Ray on battery and percussion. He's the drummer. And this is the first time that we've actually played the Futura model. That's the band that you performed with, and this mm -hmm. is the band that you right. also recorded with. Exactly. Okay, good. Cool. So this, so... Um, Can we, we hear something? We will, Well, I think we should probably... Talk about it some more? Yeah, we we can. Um, I think maybe we should play it at the end. Hold on, we're getting some strange notes. Mm -hmm. My eyes are shot. I can't read that from over here. Okay, I'm going to read a strange note. If you can excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Before we play the Futura model, uh, you mentioned earlier Vincent Price. My oh yeah. Vincent Price. So before we play the Futura model, this is. And we got to talk about Christopher Lee too. Yeah. Exactly. Sir Christopher Lee. Exactly. So this is um, from a 1996 album. After Radio Werewolf ended, I wanted to do something completely different, and I approached Christopher Lee because I had known he oh, his main ambition in life was to be a singer. He loved opera, right? Exactly, and we had a mutual passion for opera. So we had a rapport, and we collaborated on this album, Christopher Lee Sings. And everyone now has heard his heavy metal music that he did later. But in 1996, this was his first official album. And I produced it, went to London and rehearsed it with him, and then recorded it in Los Angeles at the Crossroads of the World, which is a very interesting recording studio in Hollywood. And this, what, what I wanted to do was give him a chance to express his more artistic and even bohemian side. So together we selected the songs we would record, and one of them was Epiphany from the musical Sweeney Todd. 
and I wanted to get Christopher Lee was sometimes a very stuffy and very self-controlled person and I wanted to get at a wilder more savage part of him that I saw in him and saw in his performances and I think in this song Epiphany that we recorded that I actually managed to get him to express an even darker and more real side of him because there was a shadow side to him and it was difficult to push him to present that. Okay, um, real quick, be before we segue into that, um, I just wanted to add something really quick. Another thing I can't quite get out of my head is something you told me last Saturday, mm -hmm. and that when you were a kid, after The Wicker Man came out, for mm -hmm. some reason or another, the film was having problems. Right. And somebody in Los Angeles managed yeah, the, to secure a space, an old theater. Which yeah, the, the, a organization called the Count Dracula Society that was run by this Hollywood eccentric named Dr. Don Reed, who was a Hollywood character of the kind that doesn't exist anymore, um, rented the four-star theater in downtown L.A., and Christopher Lee came there for the L.A. premiere of The Wicker Man. And I'd met him very briefly there that was 1976 i think or 70 maybe 77 i'm not sure okay isn't there a scene in the wicker man the wicker man when that constable visits lee at his villa mm -hmm. he's in a kilt right and is lee playing the piano and singing he he, do, he does sing a little bit in the song i mean in the film yeah and he's playing the piano, I believe, isn't he? I'm not sure if in that particular scene, but he definitely sings in the film. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, so are so we going to... Th so this is from my album, Christopher Lee Sings. Christopher Lee singing Epiphany by Stephen Sondheim from Sweeney Todd. Okay, here we go. I had him, and then... I had him! His soap was bare beneath my hands! No, I had him! His soap was there and he'll never come again! When? Why do I wait? You told me to wait! Now he'll never come again! There's a hole in the world like a great black pit and it's filled with people who are filled with shit and the vermin of the world inhabit it. But not for long. They all deserve to die. Tell me why, Mrs. Love, tell me why. Because in all of the whole human race, Mrs. Love, it, there are two kinds of men and only two. There's the one staying put in his proper place, and the one with his foot in the other one's face. Look at me, Mrs. Lovett, look at you. No, we all deserve to die. Even you, Mrs. Lovett, even I. Because the lives of the wicked should be made brief, for the rest of us death will be a relief. We all deserve to die. How about a say? Come and visit your good friend Sweeney. You, sir. You, sir. Welcome to the grave. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. Who, sir? You, sir. No one in the chair. Come on, come on. Sweeney's waiting. I want you, leaders. You, sir. Anybody? Gentlemen, I don't be shy. Not one man, no, nor ten men, nor a hundred can assuage me. I will have you. And I will get him back. Even as he gloats, in the meantime I'll practice on this honorable throat. And my Lucy lies in ashes, and I'll never see my girl again. That's the worst weeks. I'm alive at last, and I'm full of glory. Okay.
Okay, everyone, Bravier Radio. We just heard uh, Sir Christopher Lee um, singing, what was the name of that release? Epiphany, Epiphany. By, by Stephen Sondheim from Stephen the musical Sondheim. Sweeney Todd. Okay, and um, I might have missed something. Are you performing on that as well? No, I produced. You just album. produced it? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, one of the things that's going to happen on the 14th as well is that Nicholas Schreck is going to be playing uh, the, uh, the Futura model. And if I'm not mistaken, don't we have a version of it here right now? We, we have the main version. This will be the first single from an upcoming album that will be coming out later this year. But again, um, to introduce the band, it's me on vocals and Aldebanarian Radiotronics, Winfried Strauss on keyboards, Onisorg on bass, Heathen Ray on battery and percussion, and this is the Futura model. And this is the first time anyone outside of that select circle has heard it. And you will be able to purchase it and get it signed October 14th at The Hole. Okay. Something else I wanted to touch upon with you mm -hmm. is some of your written works that are about to appear or on right. the next, in production. The next book that should be coming so to speak. out is Lucifer's Leinwand, which is a German translation and an updated edition of my 2001 book, The Satanic Screen, The Illustrated History of the Devil in Cinema. And that will be coming out from an Austrian publisher later this year. Um, and then a new updated version of my 2011 book, The Manson File, Myth and Reality of an Outlaw Shaman, will also be released. That's going to be released as well. Yeah, so wow. it will be an embarrassment of riches. Who is releasing the Manson book? We're doing that ourselves through through uh, World Operations, my own company. Will you put a copy aside for me? Maybe. Okay. Um, great. Um, the um, I'm sorry. The history of, or the Luc Lucifer's line bond. Lucifer's line bond. Yeah. The the. Satan is presented on the silver screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can you elaborate on it a little bit more? Tell us a little bit more what's happening there. Yeah, basically, it's a it's a chronological history of the devil in cinema, going back all the way to the prototypes of the motion picture in Magic Lanterns and the earliest technology of projecting images. Strangely, people always in the West, at least, were drawn to using images of the devil. The first Magic Lantern and Camera Obscura, that was the prototype of the cinema, was always using satanic imagery. So then it traces how the French filmmaker Georges Millet, some of the first films that were made with special effects were about the devil, then into the silent era, particularly the German expressionists. Some of the, some of the most important landmark films in the history of cinema have concerned Satan and the devil. And then one thing that makes the book particularly unique from my perspective as a former devil worshiper, which I'm not anymore, but uh, I think I have a deeper understanding of the metaphysical essence of what the devil is. And I've added to this edition, which will also eventually be available in English as well as German, a very clear theological definition of what the devil is. And that's one of the most misunderstood aspects of religion. I think. Can you tell us? Can you tell us? Can you tell us? Well, it would take a whole other hour and a half to explain it in detail, but to, to sum it up as concisely as possible, the devil is not at all what the popular consciousness imagines it to be. If you look very deeply into the Middle Eastern religious lineage and tradition from which this figure called the devil or diabolos or in hebrew satan it is a celestial messenger in the service of the supposed creator god jehovah yahweh allah this particular the, the god of the abrahamic religions that is given these three names in all three of the abrahamic religions Satan is not the opponent of God, the Creator. He is a messenger of God, the Creator, and he is serving his purpose. 
And if you look very deeply into this ancient oral tradition that became the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran, the devil is actually one of the most faithful servants of God. And it's only through very bizarre and and uh, almost absurd misunderstandings of translations that it's come to believe that there is an op opposing force to God that is the devil. So, I mean, it's it's a very complicated subject, but that's, I think that would probably shock people enough to understand the devil is not the opponent of God. He is sent to earth as, he's he's not exactly one of the angels, but he is a, like he's if you a metaphor that I've used in some of my other work about explaining exactly what the devil is. If like if, if the God is the mafia don, the devil is his enforcer that comes to earth to make sure you're obeying the mob. He's the 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 actions that the devil makes are to test your belief in God. They are not. He is not an adversary to God. He's an, ad, he's an adversary in the sense that he's an attorney for God, judging man, making sure that God's creation obeys him. And that is true in all three of the Abrahamic religions. So, but that, you know, so I give the background of what the devil actually is, which has not been done very well in most popular culture expressions of this theme. Right. In, so that will be in Lucifer's line bond, which will also be available in a new edition in English as the Satanic Scream, and then the Manson File, Myth and Reality of an Outlaw Shaman will also be available later this year, and I'm working on the update right now. What always happens whenever I've done these three Manson projects, the Manson File, Charles Manson Superstar, and this new version of the book, Every time I think I'm done with the research, when I'm done, then a whole flood of new information comes in. Right. But so, isn't it already pretty late in the year? Is this supposed to come out 2017? Yeah, I'm hoping to get it out by December. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so the thing is, there's always new information, but you know, it's it's an endless thing because it's such a complex case and complex phenomenon and people believe so many wrong things about it correcting it require it's it's you know a 900 page book to... when i think about all the research you must be doing one of the things that really stands out is that a key player in all of this is somebody who's actually never responded to any of your letters namely tex watson right and and yeah tex watson who's supposed doing all this research but without well i'll sum that all up by saying if if this, if the crimes were understood properly, we would be talking about the Charles Watson murders. How many people even know the man's name? They they hardly know him. They hardly know what I he looks like. I thought it was like. Carl Watson. Right. You see, he's an obscure figure. He's he's the person who did these murders, and as far as my research has shown, he's the person who he was the the instigator the, of them. And Hinman too. No, that's too complicated to get okay. into. That that was Bobby Beausoleil. But anyway, that's that's why it's taken. I've often said those three crimes, and and maybe you could say there's five crimes involved in the whole constellation that happened in the summer of 1969. It's taken 30 years of looking at all the vast web of interrelated information to figure out even a scintilla of what really happened and we still cannot definitively answer there are many mysteries and puzzles about each and every one of those events but this what i hope will be the final update of the manson file will clarify as much as i've been able to ascertain but as i say the mysteries will continue forever and as we get to being a half century away from the crimes it's very likely that we may never know the full truth. Do you write any fiction? That's going to be the next phase of what I concentrate on. I've been I've been working for a very long time on a trilogy of novels set in the 60s that vaguely uses as a framing device the Kennedy assassination. So 
when I'm done with these series of books and also a memoir that I'm going to be putting out as well, then I pretty much want to take a sabbatical from nonfiction. And, Research. Yeah, and, and not, not so much concentrate on saying what happened, but more uh, novels and creative writing rather than reporting. So that will be the next phase of my writing work. I can't stop thinking about this uh, <clears throat> experience you had in the Valley of the Kings. Mm -hmm. Has anything like that ever happened to you since? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to talk about mystical experiences briefly to a general audience because you don't know exactly what their experience has been. But, I mean, I, I am a Buddhist practitioner, and my main focus in life is my spiritual initiation. That That's the key of what my existence is about, but it's actually, I don't really think it's worth talking about in great detail because it can it can confuse people and mislead people. And it's very easy to project fantasies and illusions on spiritual experience. Sure. But I will be discussing how that experience informed my musical work. Okay. But one easy way for all of us to have a sort of a spiritual experience is experience is by listening to a cool bit of music and because we now are almost at the end of the show do we have one more tidbit of music yeah uh i had mentioned earlier that uh, as, far, as far as the inspirations in my music uh in that early punk phase in 1977 this germs concert that i went to the reason i went to it was hoping that it would be the screamers, screamers. And the Screamers were one of the most powerful live performers I've ever seen. And Tomato Duplenty, the singer of the Screamers, became a friend. And even though I was much younger than him at the time, a sort of mentor. I found your poem to him. You poem to him moving. Yeah, you can you can find a poem that I wrote to to him and for him for the memorial of his death that was performed in Los Angeles a few years ago. You can find that on my YouTube channel, the Nicholas Schreck channel. Uh, there's a poem to Tomato de Plenty. But this is one of my favorite songs from the Screamers, and uh, it's called Ava Brown, and this was recorded in 1977 by the Screamers. <laughs> Love and 
Okay, everybody. Uh, I'm sitting here with Nicholas Schreck. We've just been listening to The Screamers. That was called Ava Brown. Yeah? Considered by some to be the best band of the world that never even had an album. Yeah? Um, my name is Jason Honey. I am Boy True. I am the Shady Listener. This has been Brave Ear Radio, Kreuzberg, Berlin. My guest has been Nicholas Schreck, who on Saturday... Uh, October 14th, we'll be hosting an event at The Hole here in Kreuzberg, Berlin. Uh, that's Schlesische Strasse 37. He will be delivering a lecture on uh, magic and music, music magic. He will also be showing Charles uh, Manson's Superstar, uh, a film that he did back in the late 80s. And he will also be presenting, presenting, presenting the album. Yeah. Presenting the album. The it's not an model. album, it's an EP, EP right? EP. Okay, yeah, the Futura model. Yeah? Uh, out on the Epicurean label, which I believe is also here in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, any final words and conclusions? Just thank you for inviting me here. Thanks for showing up. It's my, been my pleasure, and uh, thank you for your thoughtful questions, and I hope to see everyone at the whole October 14th. Me too. Thank you, and good night. Good night. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a Radio on Full Moon special with Brave Ear Jason right, Oni and Nicholas Shrek. One ear. Keep on listening. <laughs>